So, Fawn, it's a pleasure to share the stage with you. She said two great people, but I don't qualify to be great. So, yeah, pleasure are. to have you here. You uh, so, I don't know for many people uh, would know that, you know, you've written about very diverse topics. Um, how did you choose these topics? Yeah, the topics, in fact, were all coming out of uh, riding the waves. And that was done in my PhD, looking at a model how national culture influences uh, the corporate culture. And from there, I wrote books uh, that were based on two things, specializations in, in the area of national culture, like marketing across cultures, HR across cultures, uh, et cetera, et cetera even managing change across culture. So in, in total, 14 books. And um, it was all based on dilemma management. Namely, it's good to talk about the differences, but can we also deal with the differences? So that is a bit the, the background of this. And I, I think it started with having a French mother and a Dutch father. It helps because in the Netherlands, it was all bottom up. And in France, it was all top down. And I still loved both families. So where does the writing come from, the French or the Dutch? I think the writing is more from my mother, from the French. Yeah. Okay. My father was more a businessman. Okay. So that's what motivates you to write. Yes. Yes. Okay. One of the topics I thought we'll do a deep dive on, and when I was going through your articles as I was preparing for this sort of conversation, you've talked about analyzing the structure of culture, which I thought was really interesting. And you compared that to an onion. So do you want to share your insights on that? Okay. Now, the metaphor of an onion is, is very simple. It has many layers. And if you just look at the onion, it's just the outside you see. So our job is to unpeel the onion. Uh, why? You have to go deeper and deeper. And secondly, it makes you cry while doing it. Yeah. <laughs> so so that is the cry. metaphor, right? <laughs> but I owe a lot in that respect to uh, Ed Shine. Ed Shine was a guy who looked at the different layers of culture. And I was really inspired. He used another metaphor. But I use the onion, perhaps again because of my mother. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, since we are part of the Tech HR conference, and you know it's all about technology implementation, what do you think are the implications of cultural differences? Yeah, like this morning, I was talking about some of the areas. And, and I think in, in all cultures, we have the same dilemmas that are created by technology. So I mentioned a couple of this morning like high t touch versus high tech. And at the end, both the Americans, as well as people from India or Japan, who are much more high touch on the Japanese and then high tech on the American side, is they have the same dilemma, but they start at different points. Very often, Americans start with high tech and say, wow, we lost the people. And in Japan, people are taken very seriously, so they start with the people and say, and how can we introduce high tech? So I think the dilemmas of digitalization, and this is just one example, are very similar. Another one is standardization versus customization. Americans love to standardize, while if I look at your food in India, everything is customized, right? Even first names, I sign books. I've never seen so many different first names. While in America, it's all John or Peter, and then you had it, right? So again, what can we do to standardize the customization? And, and the pizza is a good example. The pizza has a standard bottom where you customize the top. And in the car in the industry, that is known. So we have the same dilemmas, but we have different starting points. And the starting point is dictated by culture. The dilemmas are beyond culture. So I think very interesting, you talked about India, you know, wanting all customization and it's just so true because uh, from right from very early on, we are told how to find better ways of doing things. So what is the advice you will have for us? Because we tend to do a lot of customization. We always want to go, you know, focus on continuous improvement. So uh, as a country, what do you think we should focus on? I mean, as a learning for us. Now, you already focused on very important things and that is the importance of education. It's perhaps one of the things that the British left in a nice way. And I'm saying that because education is crucial to the future of a society, of a company, of uh, your own family. So don't forget, and perhaps you're not conscious of it, but India has done very many good things. 
Another thing is you're the biggest democracy in the world. Don't lose that. So in other words, the base is there. And now just grow. And, uh, and I would say uh, the um, important issue you should deal with in India is how to take advantage of the diversity within India. Because there are so many diverse groups. If you just look at your number of languages, the different religious groups, but even in Hinduism, you have many diverse type of approaches. And if you get all those differences together, you're in great shape. But again, like I said this morning, it needs different paradigms. So I also think geographically, you're very nicely placed between East and West. And um, adding this all up, all the bases are there. But there is still a lot of work to do, as, as you, you all know. Good to know that you have faith in India. Nice yeah. to hear that. Or maybe you're just saying it because you're here. But I think there is an opportunity for us. So I was reading your article again on this cultural you know, uh, biases and differences. So I, one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, you know, and you talked about it in your article, how do you match cultural norms to business action? Yeah, at the end of the day, I think most of the things we do in uh, business literature is either Anglo-Saxon or very particularly Japanese, like quality management, although Deming started it from the US. But there are things that we have done that are very culturally biased. And in fact, most things we have done. And there is now a time that we should find models and approaches that go beyond culture. So in leadership, we call that servant leadership. And you know why it's such an easy concept? Because many of you are either mother or father. And when you're a mother or father, you know what it is to be a servant leader. You're there for your kids to grow even beyond you. Now, if we practice that, obviously as a metaphor in business, we have a model that works everywhere because I think parents in the world have that in common. I don't know a culture where children are not truly loved by their parents and also approached in a way that they can grow. So that's one example. But there are many examples with funny words like mass customization, co-opetition. These are all words that capture the new approaches we need to deal with diversity. So coming back to your question, cultural norms are implicit in most of the things we have developed so far, and there is a need to go beyond it. And do you see the cultural norms changing with generations as well? Do you think there, is, there are differences in culture in terms of how uh, Generation X or Y would see it, and a millennial would? Are there differences, and what are they really? Yeah, I think it's gender, it's generation, it's nationality. Very often forgotten discipline. Are you an accountant, or are you a marketeer? or etc. They have different worldviews. The problem is, it is so diverse that companies, and I've seen many, that approach diversity management like we have a workshop on gender and then the next day on generation, said no, the problem is the dynamics between all these diversities. And that's why we advise people, start with the issue. What is the issue? and then perhaps label it by, oh, that's typically male or female, or that's typically whatever. But don't start immediately boxing people, oh, it's a female, that's why she will do this, and males, oh, they do that. Uh, that's not good enough. And, and we, we see the same in multiculturalism internationally. I remember when I started this business 35 years ago, 40 years ago, there were a lot of requests, can you prepare us for India? or this family is going to Singapore, can you prepare them? We hardly find it because when they go to Singapore or India, their team is multicultural. So what are you preparing for? So the same with diversity. Don't put them in boxes. Start with the issue. And this afternoon in the workshop, we will work on how do you do that. We call that dilemma reconciliation. Uh, and, and it's asking the question, how can one side reinforce the opposite? And then you're in great shape. So when you, uh, before you started sort of work on this topic on culture and, and where you are now, uh, have you seen a shift in the last 20 years in anything? I mean, any insights that you have or something that you know said, oh, wow, I didn't know that. Was there a moment? Yeah, I, I think one, one thing is clear. It's not good enough only to explain the differences. I know a lot of people in my field that explain differences 
and then run out of the room and say, and good luck. It's not good enough. We need a lot of attention, and you see the shift in terms of how do we deal with those differences? How do we take advantage of those differences? That's one. The other thing is, we, and obviously this whole conference is about that, is how can we be helped by technology? And I, I think we can. There are a lot of technological supports. We have developed a lot ourselves, but there are other things uh, in the market that uh, help you, which is new. Five years ago, you hardly heard about these type of, of supports. So that is the second big change over the last 20 years. And, and thirdly, we, uh, and that, that sounds funny, but we get more males into multiculturalism. It was a very female thing. When we uh, tried to get and grow our company to 20 people, literally nine out of 10 applicants were female. Great, it gives a nice environment, although only females together it's a good thing. It's a good thing. <laughs> it has good aspects. But the mix is even better. And uh, so those are the things that are changing in our field. And, 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 and uh, I, I hope it will, because don't forget, multiculturalism and the understanding of it is one, or the lack of understanding, is one of the greatest causes of the trouble we have in the world. People don't understand other cultures don't understand other political movements, like are you a Democrat or are you a Republican? Uh, everything is polarized because we don't have a clue how to appreciate the differences in others. And um, it's still amazing that I'm part of KPMG, that 90% of KPMG people are working on technical stuff while and we have some colleagues here of KPMG here from, from uh, the same uh, environment here, is that we need to be sure that the human side is integrated into that technical side. Now, let me be more precise. In mergers and acquisitions, we come in as the last moment when the big consulting firms, including KPMG, have left a mess they have wonderful technology, they have wonderful legal stuff. It's only these damn people working here. And then we come in too late. So another lesson is integrate the cultural stuff with the business stuff. And that's what we're trying to do at KPMG now, rather than separating the two. That's interesting. Uh, so for people who've not read your book, uh, Riding the Wave, um, if you were to summarize it and tell us, your, you know, if, I mean, like a summary of your book, if you could share with the audience, I think, uh, being lazy and not reading the book, really. The book uh, describes seven dimensions of culture. And in a nutshell, it's about rules versus exceptions. It's about individual versus group. It's expressing emotions or holding them to yourself. It's about analytic versus synthetic. It's about bottom-up and top-down. It's about control the environment or go with the flow. And finally, it is about are you organizing time as sequences or in parallel? So these are seven dimensions. Then the other part of the book looks at corporate culture. And we have a cookie cutter model with four typologies. The guided missile, which is the Anglo-Saxon model. The Germanic model, which we call the Eiffel Tower. And then we got the family, which is more Asia and Latin America. And we got the incubator, which is, if you like, the little pockets of uh, Silicon Valley, a bit of Amsterdam and, and what have you. And uh, I'm trying to tie the two together, how the seven dimensions dictate the way you think about an organizational culture. And then the last part of the book looks at dilemma reconciliation. How do you deal with the opposites? That's terrific. So uh, all people here, uh, most people here are from HR. So um, HR generally is, tends to be seen as the, the, keep, the culture keeper or the culture builder. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, what role does HR have to play? What role does business have to play on building a culture for an organization? Right. First of all, after my PhD, I joined Shell, the Anglo-Dutch company, and I did nine years of HR myself. And what I found is uh, two important things. First of all, the main aim of HR 
is to be giving up your role by transferring it to where it belongs in the leadership. Okay? Now, that's a long role. Uh, I've seen enormous amounts of HR people not understanding the business. I think it's crucial for HR people to understand the business. I was lucky that becoming out of an academic environment because I did my PhD pretty young, and I went into a research site of Shell. Now, the research site felt like an academia, and I understood their way of thinking because I came from it myself. That was very helpful. So, two things. Know the business you're in, and secondly, because of that, make sure you transfer it to management, to leadership where it belongs. Because it's not something that you should solve. Uh, there was an HR guy of KPMG coming to me and said, Fons, we have an issue on collaboration between specializations. What should I do about it? He was the head of HR in the Netherlands. And I said, it's not your problem, it's their problem. So what do you do to help them to solve it? And uh, that's very often forgotten in HR. HR shouldn't have problems. Leadership has problems. The organization as a whole has issues. And you need to be a coach. And you need to be facilitating that process. So you should give them tools where they can do it themselves. That would be my advice. And it's often okay. forgotten. So um, what is the one sort of advice you would give all the tech HR participants? Is avoid certain language that we often use. Like, let me give you two examples. The word balance. The worst you can have in life is balance. Because balance is the middle of two extremes that exclude each other. So it's already assuming that if you go one side down, the other goes up. And Myers-Briggs is based on that, and corporate cultural models are based on that. All our models are bipolar. And the middle is balance. Avoid balance. Have work-life balance. You do half of your emails at home, so you piss off the family and the emails are bad. I would like to replace it by the word integration. Ask the question, and that is the crucial one. Second point, how can one side help you with the other side? So turn around human resources in resourceful humans, and you're in great shape. Thank you, Fons. That You're was amazing. Welcome. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. You're very it. welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.